Video number 96 from Mytho Religious Series Book 4. Ancient Sky Gazers or Travelers or Aliens? Part 5 in India, Asia. Dear fellow truth seekers, in my last few videos, I have shared information from various artifacts around the world that seem to prove that our so-called primitive ancestors had much higher astronomical knowledge than currently told by historians. In this video, I am sharing further information about more artifacts from around the world that seem to prove that our ancestors might even have the ability to navigate the skies using flying machines and or aliens had visited our planet in the distant past. Vimana in India In his book, Chariot of the Gods, author Eric von Däniken theorized that the chariots used by the gods in various cultures were actually aircrafts that are used by visitors from a different planet who visited us in the remote past. Among these aircrafts were what the ancient Indians called the Vimana. The following information is mainly quoted from an article about Vimana in Crystallinks.com with some additional information from the Anti-Gravity Handbook by David Hatcher's Childress, The Ultimate Frontier by Eklal Kushana, and also from Wikipedia. According to Wikipedia, Vimana is a Sanskrit word with several meanings ranging from temple or palace to mythological flying machines described in Sanskrit epics. The Ramayana epic told many tales about the Vimana, a double-deck, circular or cylindrical aircraft with portholes and a dome. It flew with the speed of the wind and gave forth a melodious sound, a humming noise. The ancient Indian wrote entire flight manuals on the control of various types of Vimanas. Basically, there are four types of Vimanas. Shakuna Vimana, Sundara Vimana, Rukma Vimana, and Tripura Vimana. Vimanas were kept in the Vimana Griha, a kind of hangar, were sometimes said to be propelled by a yellowish-white liquid and sometimes by some sort of mercury compound, though writers seem confused in this matter. It is most likely that the later writers on Vimana wrote as observers and from earlier texts and were understandably confused on the principle of their propulsion. The yellowish-white liquid sounds suspiciously like gasoline, and perhaps Vimanas had a number of different propulsion sources, including combustion engines and even pulse jet engines. The texts on Vimanas talk about the following. The secret of constructing airplanes which will not break, which cannot be cut, will not catch fire and cannot be destroyed. The secret of making planes motionless. The secret of making planes invisible. The secret of hearing conversations and other sounds in enemy planes. The secret of receiving photographs of the interior of enemy planes. The secret of ascertaining the direction of enemy planes approach. The secret of making persons in the enemy plane lose consciousness. The secret of destroying enemy planes. Unfortunately, Vimanas, like most scientific discoveries, were ultimately used for war. When the Rishi city of Mohenjo-daro at the Indus Valley was excavated by archaeologists in the last century, they found skeletons just lying in the streets some of them holding hands as if some great doom had suddenly overtaken them. The skeletons are among the most radioactive ever found, on par with those found at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Ancient cities whose brick and stone walls have literally been vitrified, that is fused together, can be found in India, Ireland, Scotland, France, Turkey and other places. There is no logical explanation for the vitrification of stone forts and cities except from an atomic blast. Furthermore, at Mohenjo-daro, a well-planned city laid on the grid, the plumbing system superior to those used in Pakistan in India today, the streets were littered with black lump of glass. This glob of glass were discovered to be clay pots 
that had melted under intense heat. It is as if the world had collapsed into a stone age of sorts and modern history picks up a few thousand years later. As a matter of fact, many terrible weapons are described in the Mahabharata, but the most fearsome of all is the one used against the Rishis. The narrative records Gurkha, flying in the swift and powerful Vimana, hurled against the three cities of the Rishis and Andakas. A single projectile charged with all the power of the universe. An incandescent column of smoke and fire, as brilliant as 10,000 suns, rose in all its splendor. It was the unknown weapon, the iron thunderbolt, the gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Rishis and Andakas. The, the Mahabharata also tells of the awesome destructiveness of the war. The corpses were so burnt as to be unrecognizable. The hair and nails fell out, pottery broke without apparent cause, and the birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. To escape from this fire, the soldiers threw themselves in streams to wash themselves and their equipment. It sounded as if the Mahabharata is describing an atomic war. References like this one are not isolated but battles using a fantastic array of weapons and aerial vehicles are common in all the epic Indian books. The previous section very accurately describes what an atomic explosion would look like and the effects of the radioactivity on the population. Jumping into water is the only respite. In the Ramayana, the Pushpaka or flowery Vimana of Ravana is described as follows. The Puspaka chariot that resembles the sun and belongs to my brother was brought by the powerful Ravana, that aerial and excellent chariot going everywhere at will, a chariot resembling a bright cloud in the sky. And the king, Rama, got in and the excellent chariot at the command of the Ragira rose up into the higher atmosphere. One example in the Mahabharata is that of the Asura Maya at the Vimana measuring 12 cubits in circumference with four strong wheels. Apart from blazing missiles, the poem records the use of other deadly weapons. Indra's dart or Indra Vajra operated via a circular reflector. When switched on, it produced a shaft of light which then focused on any target, immediately consumed it with its power. In one exchange, the hero, Lord Krishna, is pursuing his enemy, Salva, in the sky, when Salva's Vimana, the Sauva, is made invisible in some way. Undeterred, Lord Krishna immediately fires off a special weapon, I quickly laid on an arrow which killed by seeking out sound. Perhaps the most disturbing and challenging information about these allegedly mythical Vimanas in the ancient record is that there are some matter-of-fact records describing how to build one. In their way, the instructions are quite precise. In the Sanskrit Samarangana Sutradhara, it is written, Strong and durable must the body of the Vimana be made, like a great flying bird of light material. Inside, one must put the mercury engine with its iron heating apparatus underneath. By means of the power latent in the mercury that sets the driving whirlwind in motion, a man sitting may travel a great distance in the sky. The movements of the Vimana are such that it can vertically ascend, vertically descend, and move slanting forwards and backwards. With the help of the machines, human beings can fly in the air and heavenly beings can come down to earth. It is interesting to know that records of such catastrophic events were also told by other ancient civilizations. The Hakata, laws of the Babylonians or ancient Iraq, states quite unambiguously, The privilege of operating a flying machine is great. The knowledge of flight is among the most ancient of our inheritances, a gift from those from upon high. We received it from them as a means of saving many lives. More fantastic still is the information given in the ancient Chaldean work 
a part of ancient Iraq called the Sifrala, which contains over 100 pages of technical details on building a flying machine. It contains words that translate as graphite rod, copper coils, crystal indicator, vibrating spheres, stable angles, etc. The following article is extracted from Ancient Indian Aircraft Technology from the Anti-Gravity Handbook by David Hatcher's Childress, 1993. Many researchers into the UFO enigma tend to overlook a very important fact. While it assumed that most flying saucers are of alien or perhaps governmental military origin, another possible origin of UFOs is ancient India and Atlantis. What we know about ancient Indian flying vehicles comes from ancient Indian sources, written texts that have come down to us through the centuries. There is no doubt that most of these texts are authentic. Many are well-known ancient Indian epics themselves, and there are literally hundreds of them. Most of them have not even been translated into English yet from the old Sanskrit. Only a few years ago, the Chinese discovered some Sanskrit documents in Lhasa, Tibet, and sent them to the University of Chandigarh to be translated. Dr. Ruth Reina of the university said recently that the documents contain directions for building interstellar spaceships. Their method of propulsion, she said, was anti-gravitational and was based upon a system analogous to that of Lagima the unknown power of the ego existing in man's physiological makeup, a centrifugal force strong enough to counteract all gravitational pull. According to Hindu yogis, it is this lagima that enables a person to levitate. Dr. Rena said that on board these machines, which were called astras by the text, the ancient Indians could have sent a detachment of men into any planet according to the document which is thought to be thousands of years old. The manuscripts were also said to reveal the secret of Antima, the cap of invisibility, Garima, and how to become as heavy as a mountain of lead. Naturally, Indian scientists did not take the text very seriously, but then became more positive about the value of them when the Chinese announced that they were including certain parts of the data for study in their space program. This was one of the first instances of a government admitting to be researching anti-gravity. It is interesting to note that the Nazis developed the first practical pulse jet engines for their V-2 rocket bus bombs. Hitler and the Nazi staff were exceptionally interested in ancient India and Tibet and sent annual expeditions to both places, starting in the 1930s, in order to seek esoteric evidence and perhaps it was from these people that the Nazis gained some of their scientific information. Amazing, right? So is it impossible that our primitive or at least less evolved ancestors could fly already? What do you think? Dear fellow truth seekers, in this video I'm not going to share my personal theory yet. However, based on everything I have shared in this channel alone, I can confidently state that the chronology of humanity's prehistory is incorrect. Also, as time goes by, older and older findings keep on coming up to the surface. Therefore, it is safe to say that I think our prehistory is much, much older than what is told by conventional historians. I will share my personal theory when it is time to do so, after sharing all the information needed to draw a conclusion. At the meantime, allow me to thank you for watching and hope to see you in my next video.